Thank you for coming out this morning to hear about extraction technology. It's a very exciting part of the industry, and we wouldn't be able to do any of this without the farmers. If you're a farmer, raise your, that's right, because without, without um, the farmers, there's no extraction, and without extraction, there would still be farmers. So um, let's, just, let's just remember where we came from and have some respect for, for those guys, right? even though what we're doing is so cool. <laughs> um, so my name is Catherine Sidman. Uh, I'm with Cascade Sciences. Uh, we're the Blue Ovens. Let me shout out for the Blue Ovens. <laughs> That's what I like to hear. High Times Cannabis Cup winner right there, top CBD edible. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so what, the way that Cascade came into this industry is, is really cool. So I've been sitting at my desk for about eight years, selling those big blue vacuum ovens to NASA, Pfizer, Merck, Motorola. Because everything that goes into space has to be vacuum processed. Everything that goes into a body, implantable medical device, has to be vacuum processed. Things that uh, are in electronics have to, be, have to be vacuum processed. And I started getting phone calls in about, um, about four or five years ago that did not sound like the purchasing arm of NASA Langley. You got vacuum ovens? Yes, I do. What's your application click? Well, I mean, there's a million kinds of vacuum pumps. There's a million kinds of vacuum ovens. And if I don't know exactly what you're doing, I can't help you. And they did not want that from me. They wanted to come at 7 o'clock at night with a lunch bag full of cash and get away from me as fast as they possibly could. And after 45 minutes, you guys might feel the same way. But that's all right. <laughs> so. I kept asking and I kept waiting and finally somebody said, it's cannabis. And I'm a girl who grew up in the Berkeley Hills and I'm like, okay, I get cannabis, but I don't get this. It's what with cannabis? Google BHL. So I did. And I went to my boss and I said, you know all those crazy calls I've been getting where people hang up? I got it. Like I know what it is and it's a thing. And my boss looked at me and said, I don't know what you're smoking, but I never want to have this conversation from you again. You just spent the last two years of your career getting a sole source contract with NASA, which means, you know, I don't, they don't have to go out to bid anymore. They just buy what I sell. Why would we do that? Okay. What a difference a day makes. Am I right? Five years later, we're a new company. We are bringing our knowledge of industrial processing, chemical processing, those applications, the ovens that we sell are built to the standard that we've been building for the FDA for 30 years, right? Because, and, and a lot of people say, ah, why are you invading the cannabis space? I'm not invading anything. What I'm doing is I'm bringing to an industry that has been woefully underserved by vendors and manufacturers the same offering that I would bring to Pfizer, the same offering that I would bring anybody else with the same respect, the same level of quality, the same level of distinction, the same level of support. And so I don't feel like we're interlopers. I feel like we're here to support what you guys are doing and to bring to you knowledge that we have from other industries that's 100% applicable to what you're doing. So that's a little bit of my background. I'm an equipment person. I'm not a chemist. I play one on YouTube. Um, I'm not an extractor, but extractors are my people, and I learn from them every single day. And honestly, the, the people that you really want to hear from right now are to my right, because um, these are the folks that are in the weeds, so to speak, and in the highly technical part. So what you'll find from Cascade is that our offering supports extraction. Pre-extraction preparation, post-extraction processing, distillation, fractioning, ethanol removal, solvent removal, consistency achievement, so you want to butter, you want to wax, you want to shatter, you want something that goes in a pen. I know how to make your oil do those things. What these folks can talk to you about a little bit more is the actual extraction and those technologies. So I want to go, ladies first, conveniently, <laughs> conveniently, um, starting right here on my right with Kachin. If you could just tell us a little bit about you and your company. Sure. 
So my name is Katya Borisova and uh, I'm part of a company called Comark. We actually are um, getting a little bit more famous with our brand name, which is Pure Five, and that's the big shiny banner that you'll see downstairs uh, when you come to the uh, floor. So what we do is we manufacture extraction technology, but the cool thing about our technology is it's something that is new to the market. It's new in the United States, not in Europe. We actually do use uh, a refrigerant, R134A, which is the safest, uh, this provides safest, fastest extraction and the most effective extraction as well. Um, okay, now we're gonna have to have an argument. And we can, we can do that. Um, <laughs> so I'm the VP of business development for the company. I'm pretty new to the industry. I actually come from a business background. I'm not a chemist as well, but got to learn a lot and saw, saw a lot in a short period of time. I'm super excited about uh, what we offer um, and um, looking forward to tell you a little bit more about you know the excitement around what we actually do. As I mentioned, we come from Europe. Our technology has been started actually from the flavor and fragrance industries. So we do extract uh, wet flour and dry flour. We don't have a problem with that. And on top of that, the extract that comes from uh, our machines is very highly concentrated. Because we are going to talk about post-processing, what I want to focus on a little bit is there are, from my perspective, from looking from the business side of things, there are two things that really matter when you talk about getting to post-processing. Um, one thing is the, obviously the quality of the starting material and also the uh, preparation of the starting material. The cleaner your starting material, a better extract you get. The other thing that really matters in order to minimize post-processing um, is the quality of the oil that you get. And so the oil that you get from our technology, and that's what we pride ourselves on, is actually as good as after winterization with the other technologies. And you're more than welcome to come and see it with your own eyes downstairs on the floor. Thank you. Yes, uh, hi guys, my name is Dustin Powers. You might have seen me on Instagram on Future4200. Um, I studied under Skunk Farm and Farm Gold, and I took their model of open source development and applied it to Instagram and have used that to chase uh, waste and problem processes in the industry. Um, so it is easy to get really good oil from good starting material, but what happens when you're stuck with all the machine trim, all the trim, all the crap that's left over? There's a lot of THC there. So that was the first process I followed. How do we how do we take care of that issue? And uh, I found that ethanol is the easiest large scale ethanol. It's available. It's safe. Um, so when we conquered that problem, then we had a recovery problem. So we built the falling film. Now I'm chasing other uh, waste process. What do you do with all the stuff that's left over once you've removed the THC? So we're looking into managing cellulose um, or harvesting cellulose, harvesting fiber. Maybe you can make an ethanol out of it and other. Uh, valuable outputs from something that most people are paying to get rid of. Um, so now I offer my services as a private consultant. I, uh, I help people set up labs, develop the proper procedures, anything from extraction, pre-processing, post-processing, fractional distillation, uh, with a specialty in pesticide remediation. And uh, we can go into that a little later, um, but I'll, I'd gladly give you guys the rundown on how to pull pesticides out of your oil, because that's gonna be a huge issue for everybody here in Oregon and uh, California as well. Um, so, yeah. Jim. Hey, my name is Jim Macoso. I'm uh, the co-founder of Lucid Lab Group. I'm um, also the head proprietor of anything that needs to get done at my company. So that includes secretary and travel agent, et cetera, and so forth. And I think all of us in here as small business owners know about that. Uh, my company is two-tiered. We, uh, um, we operate several labs through uh, brand and technology licensing in Washington here in Oregon and in Nevada with a, a few other states coming online, but we operate primarily in recreational states and then uh, the second tier of our business, uh, we develop technology and capital equipment for the laboratory space. And you know, just real quickly, we kind of got into the uh, technology and equipment development uh, aspect of our business kind of by accident. Um, a few years ago when we started our business in 2015 in Washington, uh, we bought you know, several pieces of capital equipment from a lot of the larger manufacturers and uh, after you know becoming proficient with the operation of that equipment we've learned that uh, you know a lot of the things that we need to do in order to produce high quality extracts um, you know required better equipment and so that's how we got into equipment design and, and technology development 
What I find really interesting and kind of a place that I want to kick off the conversation is that you've got three folks that are essentially have the same goal in mind and they're doing it very differently. And we haven't even touched the panel that, that, that I'll be on over there this afternoon at four o'clock, which is about light hydrocarbon extraction, which is a, a way nicer say, way to say BHO, right? And so um, <clears throat> this plant, this is what I've learned. This is a complicated botanical. This is complicated. There is no one right way. Steam distillation doesn't get it all. Solvent extraction doesn't get it all. CO2 processing doesn't get it all. Katja's gonna arm wrestle me and tell me that hers gets it all, and it may very well, and if that's the holy grail, I'm on board. But what I've learned about this plant is that we are trying to trap things, terpenes, um, that are highly volatile. Terpenes exist on this plant, not for your and my enjoyment. They exist on this plant so that bees and other pollinators come over and get them and propagate the plant. So, so when we try to capture something like terpenes, there's a reason that when you're in the parking lot outside of your labs, everybody knows what you do inside. Do you know why? It's because there's a cloud of terpenes around your lab. There's a reason that, you know, when my son was in high school and there was something in a baggie, in an Altoids container, in a sock, in his underwear drawer, I knew it from the hallway. It's because those terpenes came and said, Mama, go take a look. Right? So, so once those terpenes are in my nose, they are not in your product and you never get them back. And so capturing these highly volatile things and stripping away heavy cannabinoids, right? That, you know, more like the CBD and the THC and the other constituents that are not as volatile, you can imagine how challenging it is to find one technology that does it all. And that's why there's this range. It's not because we all can't agree, it's because the plant is complex and so there are a lot of complex processes and that's why it's important from your point of view to start with the end in mind i want to make cartridges and i want them to be uh terpene rich you need a different machine than i want 99 percent thc water clear all day two different processes right two different modes a great product though <laughs> fair fair and that's why there's a customer for all of you. There's a customer for everyone, but you have to decide. And you be a specialist first and get started. So what I'd like to do is I would like to give um, each of these three an opportunity to talk about what comes out of their extraction process. So is this a terpene rich product? Is this a high THC product? Does it represent the whole plant? Is it more one or the other? And then I'd like some back and forth between you guys about how you dovetail together. And then really, I know that they can talk all day long about what they do, because you know I could, right? You've only known me five minutes, and you know I could talk all day long about what I do. I'd like to hear what you guys are after, specific things. I got a problem with pesticide. I want to make those huge CBD crystals. What on earth is water clear? How do you capture a terpene? I have 500 pounds of trim from two years ago that if I don't do something with, I don't know what's gonna happen. So let's have those conversations. So get your questions ready while these guys tell you about their favorite thing. Katya, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, because you brought terpenes to the conversation, I'll, I'll start there. Um, and I'll mention a little bit what you get from with our technology. So um, the, there are two key products that come directly from our technology. You can run your material first to get a dirt rich oil. We actually, our technology is a completely closed loop and it does preserve the terpenes. So uh, it's a shorter cycle to do that. Um, and um, our technology works with low pressure and uh, room temperature. Right. So that's what allows, you know, really to preserve the most uh, um, of the plant that you really want. You then get this material, you run it second time, and you run it now for the CBD concentrate which is a very nice, rich, honey color concentrate that you get directly from the technology. Um, as you've mentioned, terpenes are very important. In fact, 
um, not many people know, but actually um, there is quite a bit of study around the terpenes. The terpenes are actually more beneficial to the humans than, than the actual CBD and, and THC properties. At least that's what I've been, I've been reading. Again, I'm not a scientist, but this is something that is just, you know, in the verge of, you know, us humans starting to learn more about how we can use that. Um, many folks do um, create isolates because of the fact that you know they lose terpenes through the extraction process and then they get you know terpenes through other means as you mentioned there are different means different technologies and kind of put it on the crystals or use it any other way so that they can give this beautiful flavor so our technology does provide both and the uh, level of concentrations um, they get like we get directly from the machine i have a report downstairs so i'm not talking out of my cuff uh, we get like a <laughs> 88.7% is what we have on the report right now for uh, cannabinoids in the oil that comes. This is a CBD oil that comes directly from the machine. And I want to, re real quick, be before you guys, you know, this is what, what, what Katya is referring to is called the entourage effect. You know, we know that Sativex, raise your hand, Sativex, pharmaceutical in, all right, thank you, dear. Pharmaceutical in, again, high times cannabis cup, where that's CBD edible. He knows because he does a ton of work with um, people with epilepsy, and he knows why the pharmaceutical industry hasn't nailed it yet. Because what they've done is they've tried to take this one little thing out of, okay, you can't have that plant, but you can have this one little part, but you can't have any other part of it. And you can have this and it's synthesized and it's fake and that's okay. Okay, that's good, but it doesn't work. It doesn't work. So the entourage effect is a, a, a jargony way of saying the plant knows if this plant is medicine then it was created to be medicine a whole plant not a weird strained off thing so we know mercine will make you tired we know pinene will kind of wake you up we know that certain ones are anti-inflammatory so so absolutely the terpenes are more than oh, that smells good right the terpenes are also medicine so being able to use those, and terpenes are also solvent. So I got, I got folks coming up to me saying, I'm vaping straight limonene. And I go, okay, that's an industrial solvent that they take carburetors and put it in a bucket on a chain and pull it out two days later and it's clean. Mm. Would you please not vape that just, just yet? Can we do just a tiny bit of research on lab rats before we're doing research on my kid's generation? You know what I'm saying? So. Tread lightly with the terps, <laughs> Dustin. Okay, so one of the issues that we saw in the industry was how do you extract thousands of pounds of cannabis an hour? What's the most efficient way? What's the cheapest way? What's the safest way? And we went through all the different procedures. You have CO2, you have refrigerants and hydrocarbons, um, and then you have ethanol, basically those are your, your, your options. And uh, we focused on ethanol because the other two require large amounts of pressure. You have to have specialized, certified vessels. Ethanol, you can do on a large scale, open vat, cold, get a highly selective extract in the upper 80% on the uh, initial <laughs> extract. Um, and your regulator is going to be extremely happy with you. You're going to pay taxes on all those all that ethanol, so now the state's very happy with you too. Um, it's completely non-toxic in any amount. Um, well, you know, unless you're drinking a bunch of it, but it, it, it removes easily, and uh, it, it just really seems to be the safest and most accepted method uh, without any consumer issue, because everybody likes the ethanol, especially if you're using organic ethanol. Um, so, really what I do is help people find the right solution for what they're doing. I don't, I don't sell any specific equipment. I help other companies sell their equipment um, through customers that I work with, but when a company comes and says we have one that's the best, it, it, it may be true for some people, but it's not true for the guy that wants to extract multiple thousands of pounds an hour for as cheap as possible. Or um, the mom and pop that doesn't have a million dollars to invest into a CO2 machine, so they want to do small scale ethanol extraction. Um, one issue we do have with ethanol is recovering the, the terpenes from it, so you're not going to get as complete of an end product with ethanol because we have no good way to recover the terpenes from the ethanol. A lot of them degrade, they lose the potentiation effect that they may have had in their natural form. Uh, but again, this is, you know, if you got the guy that's dealing with everybody's machine trim, 
uh, he may not care about the, the terpenes, although it, it definitely seems to be that the best medicine has the terpenes. A lot of this is about making money too. This, this is turning into a business, so a lot of these companies need to find their niche, and one of those niches is in processing massive amounts of waste product. Um, so if you're looking to make distillate, which is the primary uh, end product for you know crap in, crap out, um, ethanol is the move. But um, again, don't let anybody tell you what they have is the right thing. Get second opinions, get third opinions, look at all the different options and make the right choice for you. So keep that in mind. Yeah, I, just to piggyback off that, um, I. 100 but can you is this thing even on yeah i'm yeah. pretty loud yeah all right so i just hear myself loudly okay uh, us too i <laughs> uh, i couldn't agree with dustin um more in terms of uh you know making sure you're finding the right solutions how many people are extraction or production processing professionals in here okay about a third of you and probably did, they get, did they get that on the camera <laughs> okay got uh, it so you know we completely agree with that mentality that really what's best for you and your facility is based on really what we boiled down to three main factors. Uh, first factor, what we kind of touched on earlier was specifically what end product are you trying to create? Second factor is what volume or what throughput um, uh, levels are you trying to hit? And then of course third is what is the regulatory environment assuming that you are Following the regulations that uh, you know that prevail in your um, in your region, uh, once we've answered those questions, and in each state that we do business in, we have to go through that same process. Then we determine, all right, what equipment, what processes are going to get us there. In our laboratories, we always opt to go for ethanol extraction because we did have a CO2 lab for a couple of years because we started with a hydrocarbon only model, and we ended up producing, wanting to produce just, in our opinion, something that we thought could be high quality and repeatable from state to state as an output product. So we ended up going the distillate route with our consumer brand. But with things that we do for other people, for instance, our white label model, we've always chosen to go with whatever product that they were trying to produce, but at the highest quality. For instance, for people who are looking for, let's say a whole plant extract that was a wax that was going to be marketable and easy to do with a lower budget. You know, we, we looked at hydrocarbon solutions as long as uh, you know the regulations were uh, were you know were capable in that region. We'd go with hydrocarbon because you know uh, light hydrocarbons in particular. What we're discussing is butane and propane. There are other hydrocarbons, uh, but but butane and propane are the most commonly used. Uh, they do an excellent job of grabbing a whole, a whole spectrum of extracts. You can do it uh, or excuse me of uh, compounds terpenes, terpenoids, and cannabinoids, uh, and you can remove those solvents very, very effectively. Of course, some people have issues with hydrocarbons because uh, uh, what's, you know, the residual that gets found in certain extracts. Um, you know, for other people, they like CO2 because it's an inert gas and, and generally regarded as safe, and, um, you know, obviously at room temperature um, can be completely purged out of your extracts. Of course, for us, we don't really like the taste as consumers, some of us, some of us perfectionists, and uh, you know there is a byproduct called carbonic uh, carbonic acid that occurs when CO2 gas uh, intermingles with water. Um, it's a preference thing, right? For us, we like ethanol because we can, as Dustin mentioned, do uh, high volumes basically anywhere where you can have alcohol, uh, and uh, um, you know we get a really high quality product uh, at a, in a very short period of time at any scale that you want, relatively inexpensively. Uh, of course, the trade-off is. You know, you need to have large volumes of ethanol, which you have to source and pay pay taxes on. Just just as a for instance, a 55 gallon drum of ethanol might cost you you know 600 and change dollars, but you're paying 1,200 dollars in taxes in order to get that delivered to your facility. And then of course, there's the restriction where if you don't have a sprinkler system, at least in the states where we operate, you can only have 120 gallons on site at a time. Which you know for you guys may sound a lot, but if you're processing 100 pounds a day of material. Um, and you don't have effective recovery systems, which I'm sure Dustin will go into a little bit uh, shortly, um, you know, you, you run into the issue of having too much solvent on site uh, if you don't have a sprinkler system. So as far as it comes to creating products and, and post-processing, any real qualified production or processing professional can create any products using any methods, but it really comes down to what are you trying to create? Of course, we're all trying to create the highest quality 
Um, but what are you trying to create? What's the scale you're working in? And, and you know, what are your production or product standards? Well, and, and Jim makes up a really good point, and he said it so easily. You have to understand the regulatory environment that you're functioning in today. I don't know the regulatory environment I'm functioning in tomorrow because there's a short session in Congress happening and they're going to mess something up for me. And the, the, the license that I bought and the process that the fire marshal, marshal stamped is, could be com completely off the table three months from now. And so we are all kind of hopping from ice float to ice float navigating through this very I mean our footing is like that right we and so <clears throat> so understanding the regulation and kind of knowing what they will tolerate is important and I know because is it is anyone um, very familiar with Katya's company Comerg and the specific technology that they're using in that refrigerant okay so I want to give Katya a second to discuss um, regulatory and safety um, challenges that they have or that they don't have so to, to address that issue because I know she has said room temperature and ambient pressure and and my interest is piqued. Sure. Um, so I cannot address um, how is it in every state. Obviously every state have different regulations but as you heard Jim mention um, certainly there are challenges with uh, some of the solvents in terms of uh, you know fire protection, explosivity, health issues for the personnel that works with those solvents. And I can speak about our solvent. I really am not a chemist, I cannot speak about the others, but I can tell you that because we are low pressure and because this is a refrigerant, it is used in regular refrigerators, it is used in HVAC units, it is used in inhalators. So there is nothing that is safer out there. You don't have to clean the solvent because there is no solvent left in the product after the extraction. Uh, as far as I know, 4% of CO2 in the air um, can cause um, in eight minutes like a vein, de brain dead or, you know, it's kind of bad. That's what I know with uh, refrigerant is nothing like that. Um, so far, um, we have uh, been installing our machines in uh, multiple states. Um, when it comes to fire departments, they do have certain regulations. As far as you don't have a volatile solvent, which refrigerant is not, you don't need sprinklers and you don't need that type of protection, is that's my understanding. Obviously, everyone needs to check their own state and just make sure. The, uh, um, what I have seen as an example is uh, um, in California, they might ask anyway for you to have a building inspection inspector coming. They would ask for a, a mechanical engineer to come and inspect and make sure that the uh, machine is installed correctly. But those are the things that they look for. There is uh, absolutely no health risk, no flammable risk, and no explosion risk without technology. Thank you. Another thing that I really I love about Dustin is that he will say things that n nobody wants to hear, but that we are all dying to hear. Right? Nobody here wants to say, I have a bunch of crap with pesticide in it and I don't know what to do with it. Because of course if you say that, everyone says, oh, I can't believe you're not an organic grower and you would even think of doing that. And what I want to say to you is, if you knew how your food was processed, you wouldn't be so persnickety, okay? If you knew how your medication was processed, raise your hand if you're a pharmacist named Russ. <laughs> Okay, he's going to laugh. He's not going to raise his hand. Russ does not follow directions. You would not be so persnickety, right? Because we buy it from the grocery store and we think it's safe. I mean, my, my generation did. Y'all are a little bit smarter than us because we raised you well. So, <clears throat> so there is an absolute... I live in far northern California. Humboldt's my neighbor. Mendo's just a little to the south. The wine industry is all about no mold, right? all about no moldy grapes, no moldy leaves, and they spray that stuff from airplanes like it's going out of style, right? The soil in Mendocino is so full of those chemicals that it will take a hundred years of no people and some rain, which God willing we're going to get this year, just to start getting rid of that. So the reality of you could be the cleanest, most fabulous, most fastidious grower on the planet, but you're on the planet. <laughs> and the planet is full of chemicals that you know like. So knowing how to get rid of those, and even being able to say, 
yeah, you know what my market is? My market is taking stuff nobody wants and taking the stuff nobody wants out of it and giving you the stuff people want. And I make money doing that. That is not something to be ashamed of. That is not antithetical to the cannabis industry. That is along with the cannabis industry. And if we're really going to get, if we're going to be the big boys before the big boys come, we need to get our arms around it. We need to get our arms around it. So Dustin, talk a little bit about cleaning stuff up. Yeah, definitely. So first of all, there's a difference between the apple you buy at the grocery store and the cannabis that you're about to smoke, because most people aren't smoking their uh, apples. And when you smoke chemicals- It's a personal preference. Right. <laughs> so when you smoke certain chemicals, you get decomp decomposition and you get different breakdown products. So the chemical she's talking about that they're spraying over the grapes is commonly known as Eagle 20. The active ingredient in Eagle 20 is mycobutanol. It's a systemic pesticide. It'll get in your soil, it'll get in your water, it'll get into your genetics. You can take a clone from a mother and you can do that 20 times from each clone, from each mother a clone, a clone, a clone, a clone, 20 times. You won't find that pesticide when you test the flower. If you extract that, uh, the active ingredients, you're gonna extract the systemic micro, and when you concentrate it into a distillate, you're gonna fail your pesticide results in Oregon because of the parts per billion requirements. So you can buy huge lots of flour, think that it's completely safe, and you won't know the difference until you've already processed it all to distillate. So now you could be tens of thousands of dollars into labor and material and equipment, not to mention the purchase of the initial material, just to find out that all this distillate you made, you have to throw away. So, can I, anybody? I mean, has that happened? Have you guys been surprised when you everybody. buy clean? Yeah, everybody. Okay, nobody's going to raise their hand because I said the camera thing. But you buy, what he's saying is you buy clean flour and it tested. But in the process of concentrating it, you have concentrated something that didn't come up in the plant material because now you're at 20% yield of 20% yield of 20% yield. And now you find it. And now what do you do? Right. And, and um, you could, we have problems with people in California buying bag soil and growing their plants in it and that seems to be the only source of micros from the soil because it's so systemic so we developed a method using simple chromatography um, if you buffer your your first pass distillate and you uh, properly remove the phospholipids you can pass that material over a mag silk column and get complete remediation a very simple process um, so we, we've actually been able to remediate all pesticides um, with that process, except for biphenethrin, um, which can be done with a, a very similar process, but a different media. So um, there's a huge niche in this industry taking waste products, things that people are basically throwing away, machine trim of one or 2%, and uh, making a lot of money on it because your input can be so cheap. Um, and I struggled with, when I, when I discovered the technology, I struggled with whether I wanted to release the information or keep it secret because I thought maybe if I release this information, more people will want to you know, grow with improper methods, so maybe I shouldn't. But when we started to really learn the problem that this is, how people who are doing everything they possibly can to grow clean flour uh, are still failing pest results, are going out of business because they're stuck on hundreds of kilos of distillate that they made that's failing, um, I thought it made more sense ethically to release it. So. I mean, if you guys check out my Instagram, I, I give out step by step on how to remediate pesticides from distillate. So if any of you guys are having that problem, feel free to contact me, find me afterwards, find me on Instagram and uh, ask me because, I mean, it's a huge issue that we have in this industry and I'm trying to help people, not just make much money on it. Uh, D Dustin brushed over it. He said it's a simple process. I assure you it's not. It's simple for people who have been making and processing extracts for several years now. But yeah, we're supposed to make it look simple. Yeah. Can simply help you do it. He can simply help you do it. The chromatography <laughs> is not simple. Anybody who runs a chromatography setup or has worked, let's say, in a laboratory where they're doing these types of processes, it involves at least some knowledge of chemistry or a really good teacher, um, but it is not simple, but it simply can be done. Yeah. Uh, and and, and on, that, <laughs> on that point, um, chromatography. So um, most of you know the, the, the steps of creating an extract or an end product from a processing standpoint, right? We have our, our cultivation, which we all love. I'm a big fan of flowers. Um, you know, anybody who ever wants to get me, a man, flowers, as long as they have some color and a great smell and have been grown organically, I would love to receive them. Uh, that's my shameless plug. But uh, we have our flowers, we extract them either using one of the main methods that Dustin described, right? Then we post-process them using, depending on the extract, through some process, some filtration process, 
before we refine them, either by distilling it and using chromatography or eliminating the distillation step and going straight to chromatography. But the whole goal with all of those steps is to create a product, an extract, that has everything that you want, whatever that end product is, and none of what you don't want. In this case, the big hot topic in our space is pesticides. So, you know, um, you know, don't get confused about the fact that you know a lot of the a lot of this information in terms of these processes are very commonly used in other industries. Somebody who was really, really smart when I first started. Um, I'm also not a scientist by trade. I'm an investment banker, uh, economist by education. Um, but they said, you know, stand on the shoulders of giants and, you know, you're going to move a lot further than if you tried to figure it out on your own. So there's a lot of really good literature about pesticide remediation in other industries. Um, there are plenty of papers out there. Um, I've, you know, I, as well as many other professionals I know, have reached out to people who have already done these types of things in universities using very expensive pieces of equipment that can give you guys the shortcuts uh, to get there. But um, you know, certainly one of the things I would encourage, especially when it comes to pesticide remediation, is definitely know your growers and who, if you can, control that to an extent. Work with only people that you know. But in cases like in Washington, uh, the, apple, the apple capital of the world, where guys are growing outdoors and are getting cross-contamination, you need to have at least someone who is proficient, either by hiring and contracting with guys that know what's going on, or somebody in-house who has at least some experience with how to remediate um, these compounds because it's as the states roll out and as regulations get more steep with regard to uh, action levels in samples it's just going to become a more prevalent problem and if you're attacking it on the front end with making sure you're, you're knowledgeable and you're taking action steps um, you'll be able to remediate much better in your lives. Yeah, yeah I like that. Um, I want to go ahead we have about 10 minutes left although um, ben took off. If we lock the door from the inside, we have all the time in the world, kids. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to hear some questions for the panel. I want you to be able to pick their brains. I know that you're going to be able to find um, Jim and Katya in their booths. Um, as much as I try to monopolize all of Dustin's time, he has to like get on a plane and go see a client. I don't know what that's all about. But um, So he's going to have to jet. Shortly after this, you can come by the Cascade booth uh, 820 and look at his media and some of the things he set up, and I'll sit there and smile while you look at it, and you'll ask me questions, and I'll say, here's his email. So uh, you guys have some questions? We want to hear them. So is it like a really prevalent issue um, coming from a grower standpoint where uh, if a grower were to source clones from someone that was using Eagle 20 that had microbutanol in their mother plants, for generations to come on a separate farm on a separate site with all different inputs, just because those individual cuts were taken, say, multiple generations down on a separate farm, that those extracts always have uh, the presence of the pesticide in them? Did you guys, guys in the back, were you able to hear the question? No. Okay, so he's, he's, he's asking for, tell me if I'm wrong. <laughs> Dustin said, we are finding that 20 generations out after cloning, if the mother was exposed <coughs> to this specific antifungal agent, we are still finding that in the concentrates, even if that clone was taken to a safe, undisclosed location and grown under pristine conditions. Is that? Yeah, yeah, even for generations to come, even not just first generation or first cut. Yeah, for multiple generations, it's a systemic pesticide, so it's in the cellular structure, it's in the DNA of the plant, and each generation will start to dilute it more and more. Um, and like I said, you. It, very quickly it'll dilute past testable on the flower, which actually is more of a problem because when you start concentrating thousands of pounds down to, to smaller amounts, it really it concentrates not only the cannabinoids, but also this pesticide has very similar properties as the, the cannabinoids. So you, all the distillation in the world, and you're not gonna get past the microbe, you're just gonna refine it, refine it, refine it down. So yeah, we in California especially, this is where this all kind of came up is there, you, multiple farmers, and it, just like you said, they they would take biclones from what they thought was safe, didn't test bad, and then they'd be they'd been growing those clones in house for years and years and years. No pesticide testing in California. All of a sudden, 
pesticide testing comes up and these organic farmers are all failing left and right. They're like, where could this possibly be coming from? We've been recycling our soil, we have good water, the water tests good. And so what we ended up tracking it back to is genetics. And I think Steve Hill did a lot of research on the systemic effect of microbutanol instead of reporting how far out they were finding it in the genetics and it was pretty and, astounding. And of course what they did, he skipped a step in there because when you get a test result you don't like, everybody knows you just go to another test lab, right? <laughs> so that was done, that was implied right. in there. Um, so the answer to your question was an affirmative yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes, sir. I uh, Evan McGregor, Sci-Fi Systems here. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to what, in your opinion, is the best way to separate THC out of CBD for the hemp industry. Uh, crystallization. What if you can't sell crystallization, crystal anymore because it's covered by the working drug status uh, 50W pharmaceuticals? Hang on until they change their mind. <laughs> I mean, you got to tread lightly on that uh, topic as it is. Uh, as you know, or uh, you may or may not know, um, the higher, even activated or decarboxylated CBD is going to crystallize, and the higher the purity, the more likely that's going to happen with your sample. Um, you know, there are a lot of patents out there with, specifically with individual cannabinoids. Um, we still charge forward and try to make the purest products possible always. And if there comes a point where somebody chases you down because you're creating awesome products and uh, selling them to people who need them, I think the industry will rally behind you uh, when it comes to that. But Because uh, remember, we're all in this together. So right? one way to, to, to separate cannabinoids is through extremely expensive chromatography media um, and an automatic flash chromatography machine. Um, it's doable. It's at an very, very low throughput, like in a couple grams an hour, and you're going to pay a ridiculous amount of it. So right now, there is no good solution other than crystallizing. That crystallization is the best and highest form of purity. Um, and but so other than that, uh, good luck. <laughs> Let me know when you figure it out. <laughs> I, have, I have time for one and a half more questions. Really? Oh, I yes. found something out on a farm oh. last week. Washington's apples, California's grapes, Oregon. We have grapes, but nuts. It's nuts. It's I, got nuts. A, I got a list yeah. of all the pesticides being applied at the farm next to a friend of mine's farm, and just the first one blew my mind and there were seven more on the list. So if you're anywhere near a nut farm, get a list of what they're and using. And he doesn't just mean like a nut farm like my office. He right. means like actually a place where there are trees that grow nuts. It so it just says nut farm. <laughs> anti-fungal, <laughs> anti-mold, anti-anti-anti, all systemic, really nasty yeah. stuff. Last last question then we're all in. I got to get on the back here. I was wondering if you'd seen um, or heard any confirmation of cannabis plants producing um, endemic uh, pyrethrins, pyrethroid compounds, which are fundamentally terpenoid compounds, including chrysoprene. And there was one not great new set up paper that was sort of published a year ago about this. And I don't know if there's any, you've seen any of that concentrate, like any concentrate, if you're seeing that. Um, at all. So I'm not even going to try to rephrase that question because obviously it's way above my She's, head, right? she's asking about uh, Here we go. the plant produces its own pyrethroids, pyrethroids pyrethrins, uh, because they, you know, that's a test in certain states. They've removed the action levels or increased the action levels in, in Washington at least for pyrethrins because that's been proven. Uh, I, I, the paper I wish I could reference, we've read, there, there was one paper circulating it has yet to be confirmed that that was actually peer-reviewed, uh, but cannabis, like other plants, do, you know, uh, terpenes, like other compounds, also serve, in some cases, a, a function of attracting certain animals so that it can cross-pollinate, but it also is a, its own natural insecticide and pesticide. Mm -hmm. Pyrethrins is a um, naturally occurring, in certain plants, pesticide, if you will. Uh, but that paper that you're referring to, it was not peer-reviewed. So, or at least if that was the argument that it wasn't peer reviewed. Right, and just like in the mum family where the pyrethroids come from, it's very likely that we'll see huge variants in the pyrethroids produced by different species or, or different variants of the plant. Just like they produce different variants of terpenoids or cannabinoids, um, I would imagine that it would produce to, uh, the pyrethroids in different uh, amounts as well, because we haven't seen it, and I haven't personally seen it or have it come up on test results in, in any of my. So to touch on that, one of the important things that we like to do, and I'm sure everyone on this panel recommends, is 
Um, we work really closely with the labs that we uh, work with in each state. We try to find the best ones. Um, pesticide testing isn't cheap. The equipment's really expensive, so the tests aren't cheap. Um, but I would encourage anyone who's serious about moving forward and creating high quality products, take it upon yourself to do your own QC, not only the stuff that's required by the state, but work really closely with a lab. And what we found is that guys that realize that you're trying to do really good work, they might not give you everyone for free, but you know, maybe every other, or every third for the lab guys in here, I'd love to get as many free tests as possible so that we can mitigate against these.